This week, the movies that made us critics. Each of us selects five movies that changed our lives. Plus, Roger's number one, the movie that made him a critic. This week on Ebert Presents at the Movies. Welcome to Ebert Presents at the Movies. I'm Ignati Vishnevetsky of Movie.com. I'm Christy Lemire of the Associated Press. Now this week we're doing something a little bit different. Ignati and I picked five films that shaped us. Our picks are pretty different. You might have heard of some of them and not some of the others. My first choice is The Breakfast Club, the Rat Pack classic from writer-director John Hughes. It did a beautiful job of blending comedy and drama and defined the generation. Well, at least it did if you grew up in the 80s like I did. Five very different high school students are forced to spend a Saturday together in detention. They all have preconceived ideas about each other and end up clashing. Judd Nelson is the rebel, Emilio Estevez is the jock, Molly Ringwald is the princess, Ali Sheedy is the loner, and Anthony Michael Hall is inevitably the geek. P, B, and J with the crusts cut off. Well, Brian, this is a very nutritious lunch. All the food groups are represented. Did your mom marry Mr. Rogers? Uh, no, Mr. Johnson. Huh. During the day, they end up getting to know each other and forging a conspiratorial bond. Here they sneak out of the library behind the back of their uptight principal, played by Paul Gleason. How do you know where Vernon went? I don't. Well, then how do you know when he'll be back? I don't. Being bad feels pretty good. As time passes, they begin to feel comfortable enough to bear their souls, share their secrets, confess their fears, and, what do you know, become friends. Oh, are you medically frigid or is it psychological? I didn't mean it that way. You guys are putting words into my mouth. Well, if you just answer the question. Why don't you just answer the question? Answer the question. Answer the question. Don't, don't be it. It's sure. easy. It's only one question. No! I never did it! I never did it either. I'm not a nymphomaniac. I'm a compulsive liar. The greatness of John Hughes's writing is that he depicted high school not exactly as it was, but as we wished it could have been. Funnier, weirder, sweeter, full of kids who have just the right zinger or poignant thing to say. But The Breakfast Club also taps into universal teen anxiety, the feeling that nobody understands you, that your problems are unique and insurmountable. Hughes took that raw adolescent energy and made it ironic and idiotic, self-referential and self-deprecating. The Breakfast Club helped influence me as a critic because it spoke to me and inspired me to figure out my place in the world, even at age 13. Now, my first film would be True Heart Susie. It is my favorite D.W. Griffith film and one of my favorite films, period. It's a silent feature from 1919 and it stars Lillian Gish as a lovesick country girl. True Heart Susie was, for me, the inspiration for several ideas about movies that have been deeply important to my work as a critic ever since. Ironically, Griffith, in trying to perpetuate Victorian morals, ended up with revolutionary ideas. For example, here in the opening title cards of True Heart Susie, Griffith's statements about the purity of women end up sounding like feminism. Griffith's sympathy for the title character expresses itself with force in his use of framing and editing. That's Lillian Gish on the left. Now, I wouldn't call True Heart Susie an old film. Griffith expresses himself so clearly that his intentions are never lost. The film is raw and ageless. Now, Griffith may not have invented intercutting or the close-up, but what he did do was make movies seem like the most natural medium for expressing human emotions. Now, next up for me is Federico Fellini's Knights of Cabiria. This is a personal and nostalgic choice. My mother loved Fellini, so just please indulge me here for a second. It stars Fellini's wife and longtime muse, the great Giulietta Messina, who is adorable and hilarious here. She could bring the house down and break your heart with equal force. Cabiria is the proverbial hooker with a heart of gold. People abandon her and take advantage of her. She gets angry and frustrated, but never gives up hope. Here, she ends up hanging out with a movie star 
whose girlfriend has just stormed off in a huff. Pagasari, baba food. Pagata grid. Scendi, monta, monta, scendi. E l'hai trovata. Vieni. Andiamo a divertirci. One night, she goes to a magic show where she gets dragged up on stage and hypnotized. She ends up bearing her soul, exposing her secret dreams of finding true love. <laughs> Devastated by the betrayal of her latest lover, the man she thought might really be the one, Kabiria returns to the same streets of Rome and finds comfort when she needed it most. Buonasera. The ending gets me every time. That famous shot of Kabiria smiling into the camera through tears, letting you know she's going to be all right. And then the Nino Rota music swells, and it's just a perfect moment. My next choice is Magnolia, writer-director Paul Thomas Anderson's three-hour epic of intertwined lives over one day in Los Angeles. Anderson sets his film in the San Fernando Valley, where I grew up. And despite the bleak realism he depicts, Anderson infuses a surreal undercurrent that grows as the film builds to a crescendo. He follows nine characters with an excellent cast, including William H. Macy, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Julianne Moore, and John C. Riley. He seamlessly weaves their lives together, including a game show whiz kid, a nerdy LA police officer, and a skittish coke addict. Yes, Stanley. Well, that was in French, and that was from the opera Carmen. And that goes, L'amour est un vaso que bella que nous ne peut pas Tom Cruise does the best work of his career in Magnolia as a cocky self-help guru whose confidence is seemingly impenetrable. You are here for me to enlighten you, to edify you, to send you off into the now not-so-unknown future, so come along with me. How to fake like you are nice and caring. Anderson masterfully orchestrates the meltdowns and epiphanies with a propulsive, fluid energy, with Amy Mann's original songs poignantly commenting on the action. And then, of course, frogs rain from the sky. You're either going to go with it or you're not. I went with it. Oh, the frogs fall from the sky. Now, I saw Magnolia when I was just starting out as a critic in 1999, and I found it really polarizing. People were either wowed by it, like I was, or they thought it was overlong and pretentious. It's one of the first films that forced me to stand my ground, and here I stand today. 